Welcome to the Smokies and Wine podcast with JB and Jamie, with the best guests, wine and chat. You know it makes sense. Sponsored by Clack and View Wealth Management, working with you today to plan for your tomorrow. Barry, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm good. Good. Always nice to be talking to you boys. Some way of uh, filling up my evening with something exciting. <laughs> well, we'll try and deliver for we'll, you. We'll try and keep that end of the bargain up. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us anyway. That's, uh, it's good it's of you. It's a pleasure, mate. It's yeah. a pleasure. How are you keeping? You're a, you're a touch of the COVID last year and, and obviously the, the heart stuff. How, how are you keeping just now? Yeah, I'm good. I mean, I'm, I'm playing a lot of active sport. I'm getting injured all the time, which is, I suppose they just come to age. You know, I'm 73 now. Although my brain has, uh, must, tells me I'm 18. My body's, you know, every uh, every innings, every session is uh, is tough, you know, but I don't know, I don't know what else to do. You know, what do you do? Do you just roll up and give up? Is that... Is that what happens when you get old, or do you go out, or do you go out in this massive explosion of energy? I think, I think I'd rather go out in the massive explosion. You're going out with a bang, I would imagine. If you no, no, there's no doubt about it. You know, the fishing's keeping me sane, but the golf's getting worse as my cricket's getting better. It sounds like a Bob Hope movie in my life. You know, everything is alternatives. But I think if you keep your enthusiasm and your passion up and your desire. Not to take the easy way out and sit in an armchair, then then maybe you get a bit more out of life. That, that's my theory. Now, I, I follow Mark Williams on Twitter, and you played Mark Williams in a challenge match at golf, didn't you, with Steve Davis? Is that right? Yeah, I know. I know. I absolutely educated him. <laughs> you know, he's such a nice guy. He's a nice guy, Mark Williams. He's a very dry, he's got a very dry sense of humour. And he's, and he's tremendously competitive. But, you know, when it, I'm not so good at sport, but when it comes to verbals and gamesmanship, <laughs> I'm, a different, I'm a different level. I've actually convinced him and Hendry that the new handicap system on the slope index had already been brought in. And I've got the local golf pro to convince him, with my assistance, that we got one extra shot on the handicap. <laughs> and, of course, the rules... Hadn't changed. Uh, I think they changed about three months after I told Mark Williams it already changed. And of course, <laughs> oh, yeah. on the 18th, I've knocked in about a five foot putt uh, to win the hole and half the match because of the extra one shot. So That's he was, he was absolutely gutted. But you know, when he realised he'd been completely outmaneuvered by a genius, it wasn't. So <laughs> <happy. laughs> Yeah, you'll be good at the old sledge and at the cricket as well, then, are you? Oh, mate, no, I do it now. I'm seven, I'm still, I've still got the loudest, I have the loudest appeal in over 70s cricket. <laughs> the umpires put their finger up out of fear for what I may do to them if they don't give their batsman out. I can feel the, I can feel the viciousness in my face and in my body when someone's hit it on the back. I don't think I've ever had an appeal turned down. They are absolutely, the umpire, I can't say this, if, just in case they might be listening, but I think they're scared of me, you know. They think I might do something dramatic or silly. So it's much easier to, it's much easier to give the batsman out and keep me happy. Does that ever change with the age? Are you getting angrier or are you just more desperate or do you just shout louder? What's happening? No, I'm just, no, I'm just finding everything. Do you know, as you get, I'm finding everything just so amusing in my life. I don't get angry anymore. There's no point. There's no point getting angry. I don't get frustrated. I'm happy all the time. I mean, I'm, I think if you really want to get to people in life, show them how happy you are. But you know what? It really pisses people off. <laughs> if you're happy, the number of people that really, they don't really want you happy. Do. Everyone says, how are you? Expecting you to say, well, the shoulder, or oh, I lost it, or the wife. It, I always say, I'm Mate, I am different gravy, good as gold. And you can actually see the envy and the hate build up in their face because they want you to be unhappy like them. And I'm just not playing that game. I'm happy all the time. And if it gets up your nose, all the better. <laughs> Do you think that's why you've been a success in business? Do you think that's infectious to the people you work with? That positivity? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I mean, I like... 
You know, I said to someone the other day, you know, my, my office is just the most amazing place and with amazing people in it. And we've done really well. So when you're really doing really well, you know, you're not under pressure. Are you? There's there's a general, you know, everyone's getting well paid, everyone's getting bonuses, and, and the job's creative and, and fun. So well, how can you not enjoy that? But the greatest tribute, despite the growth of the company over the last, you know, 40 years, I say 40, my son says 10. That's because he's done <laughs> <in> it. <laughs> um, but what I'm saying is I'm surrounded every day of my life with the sound of laughter. And I look at people with a smile on their face. And that's probably the greatest compliment I can ever have for the business I've built. Massive business as it is. It had to start somewhere. So we want to go back to the, the old snooker halls in Romford. Um, just talk us through, so you, you got your first one and what you were thinking, why you went into snooker in the first place. No, that, two stages of this, really. One was, uh, as a young child to the council, I got a breakthrough job as a finance director of this investment company, looking to diversify. And one of the things that came up was a chain of snooker halls. Never been in a snooker in my life. If I had been in one, my mum would have probably clipped me around the ear because they were bad places. Um, they were wonderfully bad places. <laughs> and uh, I fell in love with it. You know, I fell in love with the game, with the people, the customers. They, they were actually just me, really. You know, layabouts and villains and chances. <laughs> we all were when we were younger. You know, we're, so how we started. And you know, there's different roads to travel down, and sometimes. Some people go to the right road, and some people go down the wrong road, you know. But the, the, from 74 up to 82 was a working relationship where I was an employee of the company. I mean, I ended up owning a third of it, but that was towards the end. And, of course, in the middle came Steve Davis on the scene and doing amateur tournaments and then doing professional, you know, doing tournaments where Davis would challenge other players in those days, I, you know, we all loved to gamble. Davis was the nugget. You know, he was a cash provider for families in Rockford because <laughs> he never got beat, and we backed him all the time. It was like a license to print money, really. And people like Alex Higgins and John Spencer, Ray Reard, and you name them, Joe Davis, they all came down and they all left skin because they all liked to bet. And if you like to bet against the nugget in Romford, you might as well tip your money down the drain or better still, give it directly to moi, which is what they did. Uh, so we had this fabulous time, fabulous time where, you know, nothing seemed to matter. Life was just one, I, I can't tell you how much, just laughed all the time. Uh, and then of course, 82, I sold the chain of snow calls, made a load of money for myself, which I'd never had money before. And because I was bored, because I didn't know what, I was 34, I was going to retire. I thought I had enough money to retire. I didn't, but in, from where I'd come from, it was just yeah. money beyond my belief. Um, and it, I just got bored after about six weeks after selling all the clubs. And I thought I'd start a little company. I call it Matchroom, named after the Romford, the Matchroom in the Romford Snooker Hall, where Davis played all his money matches. And, uh, so it had some emotional value. And I thought the object of it was. I've got enough money, so let's have some fun. Let's uh, do some snooker tournaments with Davis, Tony Mio, Terry Griffiths, subsequently other players. Uh, never really started to make money because I, I thought in my mind then I'd, I've got enough money, but I, I had to do something with my time, you know. So it just sort of started with me and a girl underneath this billiard ball in Romford. And then over the years, somehow or the other, a lot of luck came into different things. And of course, being smart as well, getting luck is great, but taking advantage of that luck is the art form. Yeah. Um, and I was, you know, I'm a, I'm a decent operator in a funny <laughs> sort of way. And we just got bigger and bigger and bigger. And that little company is now, I think, or one of the biggest sports motion companies in the world. Offices all over the world, people all over the world. Everyone knows us and trusts us because we've got a good reputation and we're still having fun, which is what we started off not thinking about money, started off thinking about having fun. And we've made a pile of money. 
But we've also had a pile of fun. As you get <laughs> older, the fun's probably more important than anything else, you know. Which is why I'm talking to you lot tonight, because otherwise I'd be sitting doing, what would I be doing? My <laughs> wife my wife is watching EastEnders on the telly. You think I'm going to... I'm an East End. Do you think I'm going to watch each Enders on the telly? You know? No. I'd rather talk to you two. I mean, and that shows you how bad East End is. <laughs> <laughs> so, see, when you had that, when, when Davis first walked walked through the doors and you, you seen him for the first time, did you immediately think, cha-ching, I've got something that's no. going to make me a lot of money here? Or what? what how did it work? I was sitting downstairs in my office and the phone went and Les Coates, who was the manager of Romford Billiardall, phone, he just said, Dubner, there's a kid up here you should come and have a look at. And I said, why is that? He said, because he's good. He said, he's good. You know, so, okay. You know, it's a Billiardall bloke. Me, underneath a Billiardall, walked up there. There was a crowd of people around table 13 at Romford. Anyone knows Romford knows. Table 13 was the match table we all played on for the big games. And Vic Harris, the Essex champion and former, well, he's, he subsequently went on to be a very good player. You know, he made a pro and won the English amateur. Davis had come from Plumstead to, pay, to play Vic Harris just for practice, you know. And there was a crowd watching and I stood there and watched. I can't tell you, I thought I saw the second coming. It's always, I hate people who are super smart afterwards. Yeah, I yeah. just saw some, um, didn't look all that great, to be honest with you, had a long... Ginger hair down to his neck. He had his backside <laughs> hanging out in his trousers. His jumper on. I don't know where it came from. A personality that was non-existent. You know, I mean, <laughs> nothing's, really changed. nothing's really changed with Davis. I saw him the other day. He looks exactly the same. But the hair's, the only thing is the hair's shorter and it's, it's white or grey instead of ginger. But what you did see was obviously he was, you know, he was trying so hard. If he'd have tried any harder, he'd have had a nosebleed. I mean, he was, you know, Fully focused on the game. And that's the only thing that caught my, my imagination was this kid's, you know, he's committed. He's absolutely committed to this game. Um, and then you know, over a period of time, and it wasn't overnight, I got to know him better. Um, I mean, I don't think he said much to me for at least a year. He was very, you know, he never looked at you. He always looked at his feet. You know, he used to stand there masturbating with his cue. You know, <laughs> I think it, it was a, some sort of like, some people have a, what babies have a blanket, don't they? He had a cue, you know. We've got, we've got a friend that used to do that as well, yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> over a period of time, I realised there was a decent young man in there and uh, we became sort of surrogate brothers, really. I mean, I was his old brother that I knew about the world. Of course, I had no ability, but a very large mouth. He had no personality whatsoever. Handshake like a wet lettuce. <laughs> and, uh, we were a good mix because he was really, really good at what he did. And I was all right at what I did, but neither of us crossed over. So I never told him how to pot a ball and he never told me how to do a deal. And for that reason, we got on really well. And it's a testament somehow or the other where that was 1977 we're talking about, 76 when I first met him. 78 when he signed his only contract with me. Uh, and we're now in 2001. So, and he's been my best mate for over 40 years. Oh. It's amazing how, and yet you couldn't find two characters more different if you try. You know, I spent five years teaching him the world. And he spent the next 40 teaching me about life. Amazing. It's an amazing. It's an amazing story that would bore everyone shitless listening to the <laughs> program. I, I find it amazing that, you know, he goes off now. I saw him on, was it last week? I saw him, we went into this fishing competition on Tuesday, which is on ITV, September the 24th, ITV4, 7 till 9. Plug, 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 plug. It's on my <laughs> schedule. Yeah, and uh, I looked at Davis and I went, Do you, you, you look a bit of a mess, as always. He went, so would you if you just spent two days in a field? I'm like, what? Because he's, he's a disc jockey now. Yeah, yeah, DJ. that's right, yeah. And he's, he's, he said, I've just come back from this little festival somewhere. I think it was Somerset. He's 63. He's spending his time in a field. He's, he's DJ Thunder Muscle. 
And that, you know, that, genuinely what his name is? Well, I think, I, I, I believe it is. I think it's a really good name because he runs around in the shower to get wet. There's still nothing of it. <laughs> but some of, but he's apparently massive in this particular genre of music. Right. I don't even know how to describe it other than say, when I listen to it, I look for a cat strangle. You know, he's making some weird no but noises. But he's into it. And I take my hat off to him because I'm finding it personally not difficult, but interesting adjusting in my life from going seven days a week, 15 hours a day or whatever, to suddenly sort of taking a bit of a backward step, you know. And it's an adjust it's an adjustment to let go when you've been a control freak. Davis has gone from snooker player, commentator, public eye into this completely new being and he's adjusted brilliantly well i think he's adjusted better than anyone i've seen and that also never seen he's totally content he just does what he wants to do i mean it's a good it's a good story he's, he's a good bloke i like him yeah. i think he can stick, he can stick around the occasion have you when you became in charge of snooker you know a decade ago or something did you ever seek advice from steve oh, yeah uh, i i talked to him about quite a few things because he gives me a different Perspective, pers perspective on it, you know. Um, with me, it's always I'm the sort of one that goes through the door first. Uh, someone needs to tidy things up, put it all in, you know, proportion to where the world is. And when I took over snooker, you know, I told him, "What do you think?" I asked his opinion, you know. He asked, and he asked me, "Did you, you know you you've done well in life? Do you really want the aggravation?" You know, uh, you're 60, well, I was 62, 63. And uh, I said to him, no, I think I owe the sport something. And that's funny, you know, I've, I've always been quite big on paying your way, uh, making sure that you remember where you come from and you don't forget certain things. Snooker, whether I, I mean, I haven't played a game of snooker. If I played one frame in the last 10 years, it's no more. I used to play every day. But I don't forget what that sport has given me. Yeah, and that was when I saw the state it was in. It hurt me to see the work that we'd done in the seventies and the eighties, in the nineties, was being thrown away by mismanagement, by self-interest, by you know top players not understanding that the game's got to be made bigger. It's not just a boys' club for them, and kids have got to be given a chance in the same way as we got given a chance when we started our life out you know it's different people don't realize what the world was like 50 60 years ago you know we talk about prejudice now there's always been prejudice just in different levels yeah, yeah. there used to be prejudice against people like me all people you know you know we've council house kids we didn't get big jobs we hadn't gone to university we, we, our dad didn't have money we hadn't been to the same school as them you know the yeah. posh geezers I mean, today, you know, any anything like that, whether it's race, religion, e economics, whatever, it's wrong. Sometimes it takes time before it actually goes. It, it's largely gone now. That sort of thing that happened to me is no longer there. Today, we're trying to make sure that no matter what colour skin you are or not, what matter religion, you're still treated, and, and that's that's how it should be. And it will get there. It may take some time, but we are making progress. So, you know, I need people around me to give me a perspective of different types of life because I'm I'm so superficial. You know, I'm just in your face all the time. <laughs> Sometimes I don't get the subtleness of life. That's a nice way of putting it, the subtleness of life. You know, I like smashing things up and getting things done. <laughs> well, it's not about smashing things up. I like it gets us straight to Chaz and Dave. What the hell yeah. was going on with Snooker Luby? Yeah, but these little things come to you, don't they? I mean, these days, and not for the last few years, a lot of my ideas come to me when I go fishing. And when I sit there with no phones, no emails, nothing going on in my small head, and you think of ideas, don't you? You know, and I think you can, I, I've never been that I'm not an inventor, I'm actually a really good copier. But most of the things I've done, you can find where did it come from? You know, I remember carp fishing in the lake in Ockenden 30 years ago thinking, why isn't fishing on television? So many people go fishing, there's nothing on. There's never anything live. Well, sport is about live, it's not about highlights. And in those days, it was 15 minutes here and 10 minutes there. 
and, and I went the next day to Sky and sold on Fishermania, which is still to this day the biggest and only live fishing event in the world, you know. So when you talk about other ideas, they come from, from different areas, you know, but they're normally copied. So if you like, I love the Ryder Cup of gold. I, I mean, it's one of the greatest events ever. So I copy it. I do the Moscone Cup. Yeah, I remember. You know, it's named after William Moscone. It's a pool, Europe. I do the Weber Cup for 10 pin bowling, named after Dick Weber. It's Europe. And all these things make money, but it's not really me being super bright. It's just seeing a formula that works, maybe putting a few twists on it, and then selling it as if it's my idea uniquely. Well, on the Moscone Cup, whose idea was it on the inaugural one to put a bar next to the table and have Higgins there? What else would you do with Alex? <laughs> <laughs> he didn't have a bar there. He probably wouldn't have turned up. You know? <laughs> and, of course, you put him in with Jimmy as well. So the two of them, were, I mean, Brilliant. There's, there's, a, there's a match that you can catch on Match and Live, I think, in, on the archive of Paul a doubles match with Alex and Jimmy. I don't know what they were on, but it's the best doubles match of ball I've ever seen. Oh, it's the one where he plays, he's first shot or something, he comes off the bottom cushion and pots the nine ball of a ridiculous two cushion. Yeah, there's so many things in that game, and Jimmy, again, is nearly crying with uh, laughter, Alex. Because Alex, Alex was on another, completely on another planet. He points the phone, he goes to the bar, yeah. the Americans are actually sitting there wondering what the hell is going on. Well, that's, you know, listen, I'm not, I'm not going to tell you that Alex Higgins was the nicest, the greatest or whatever, but certainly he was the most interesting because you never knew what he was going to do next. <laughs> and it's that sort of personality excitement that sometimes we miss out on in today's world of winners. I mean, today... All the athletes, all the sportsmen, they're better controlled, they're better educated, they've got better technique, they've got more, you know, so many things when they're better. And you can't install a personality in someone, that's either there or it's not there. Everything else is taught. And when it's taught, and it's sometimes over taught, it actually destroys any personality that's trying to come out because the moment you show your own personality, you don't perform at the highest level. Yeah. And today's world is about winners, yeah. not just about personalities. You know? So it's it's good and it's bad, but it's good for kids to say that's how you 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 should be like Steve Davis. Look at that, ruthlessly efficient. But there's a little bit inside even Steve Davis that would have loved to have been a bit of Alex Higgins. I bet because he because he did things and he saw a life that was like oh that's oh, that's something different. That is. Have to do that. Of course, you don't want to do it, and you can justify not doing it as well. That's the famous spitting image sketch, isn't it? Yeah. When you're, when you're trying to get a nickname for Steve Davis, and he wanted to be exciting and everything. That's legendary. Got it. Interesting. <laughs> my, my daughter wrote to the producers of Spitting Image. Katie was then, I think she must have been nine or ten. She wrote complaining that my puppet didn't look like me. Because <laughs> he had gold bling on him, which I never wear, and was smoking a cigar, which I never, never smoked a cigar. And my daughter was incensed, and she demanded a character rebuild. <laughs> Obviously, was, I wasn't important enough. I didn't get it anyway. Yeah, it was total Arthur Daly, wasn't it? Yeah, no, but it was it was everyone's visualization of what does a promoter look like? Yeah, a you know, boxing promoter, no good. Any type of sports man, I was got to go. I got to have bling, the big jacket, you know. I mean, it was a stereotype, but anyway, I, I was to my mind, I was happy to be part of the uh, drama of creating the interesting Davis character because we made more money as <laughs> Steve Davis being interesting in your very comments yeah, yeah. than Alex would have made out of being sensational personality. You know? exactly. It's just a question of how you market. But we are, the whole world is getting sanitised. I don't want to get too deep in, but yeah. it's getting sanitised. There's going to be cleaner upon clean before you get the commercial paybacks. Someone like Alex Higgins was non-sponsorable. Yeah. Follow me, because he was too risky. Davis was 100% sponsorable. No risk whatsoever. You knew, on time, say the right thing, 
behave well, speak well, boy, you shit this. But <laughs> deliver. Did Alex ever get into Matchroom? Was he? Uh, ever- no, yeah, no. He, I Ever on the horizon, no? I didn't, you know, a couple of times he asked, and, you know, we had a love-hate relationship, him and I, you know. There were days when you'd want to put your arm around him because he was sad in some ways. He's very vulnerable, didn't have any friends, didn't drive, couldn't back a winner in a two-horse race. I mean, he was just the worst. Couldn't turn down anything. But then there was the other side of him, which was... When you got into him, just you know, he was a nice kid in there, but just I don't know, say grow up, grew up the wrong way. He wasn't. He, it, it, there was some fire in him. There were some demons that he couldn't quite deal with. I mean, we came to blows a couple of times. He'd have a fight with anybody. You know, but twenty minutes later, it'd be your best mate. You know, and it just it was a weird anomaly, anomaly of a man. He wasn't. You know. My wife used to, I know women used to really like him because he, oh, bless him, you know. He, he always looks if he just needed a little scrawny kid, but, you know, had plenty of bottle on him and have a row with anybody. But he always looks if he needed an arm around him. But if you're sitting on a, pl- a train, reading the paper, and he, you see him walking down the corridor of the train towards you, you put the paper up. <laughs> The idea of having two or three hours next to Alex was never going to work, you know. But we miss him, and he was he was certainly unique, you know. You mentioned boxing earlier on. When was it that you decided to get into the boxing game, Barry? Were you there was no crossover there? Did you stop snooker and, and move into boxing, oh. or was there a bit of both? No, no, no. I mean, I've never stopped anything. Um, I just add things to it, you know. It's a bit like oh, ever growing beast, really. I mean, I'd always been a, a Fight fan. I tried it myself in my late twenties. I wasn't very, to be honest, I wasn't very good, but I used to love it. I actually used to love hitting people, but I hated it when they hit me back. Yeah. So you know, it was bound to be a short career. Um, fortunately, I broke my shoulder fighting every way. I was a lie every way, and uh, that was a great excuse to retire before I got seriously hurt. But I, I just loved it. I love one on ones. I love any type of confrontation. Yeah, win or lose, and, and mostly lose, I suppose. But I've been a fight fan for years, and I've gone to shows, amateur and professional. I'd always thought that the punt had got a bit cheated. In those days, it was pretty well a monopoly of one promoting group that did it. Fights were poor most of the time. There was the odd good one, of course, but most of the time, it was they were just nicking money. And I always felt I could do a bit better, you know, I only promote sports I've got a passion over. If I don't like a sport, you know, don't do it to make the money. I make money, I make plenty of money, but I can I make it out of sports I care for. So uh, boxing was something which I thought I could do a good job on it. I thought it'd be exciting. And probably being the Gemini, a little bit of a butterfly, floating personality, I'd, I'd had to 10 years in the snook, and I was probably looking to add something else, you know? Because uh, 10 years, we pretty well run it. We won so many things in that period of time. Uh, dominated the snooker, started looking at different... And boxing just appealed to me. And of course, I stumbled on my first big show, was Frank Bruno and Joe Bugner, yeah. which ends up being one of the top 10 all-time hits on television. And I didn't, even, I didn't have a clue what I was doing. But I just went with the flow, you know? I just... Eddie, Eddie, my son, who's obviously a different level boxing promoter to me now, he's huge, but he always says to me, I don't know how you did that. <laughs> Not on day one, you know, and he, don't, he never gives me a compliment. But he always said, I don't know how, I mean, how did you, how did you put the cards together? How did you put the finances? How did you do the TV and the sponsorship? I, don't know, I haven't got a frigging clue. <laughs> it just seemed to happen, you know, because we had the right product, you know, basically it was a fight that, I wanted to see. And when I do sporting events now, my, my first question is, every time we do an event, of which we've got 650, 700 days of events this year, my first question is, would I enjoy it myself? Would I think I was getting value for money for my ticket? Yeah. Yeah. Now, if I can tick those two questions, I'm pretty sure most other normal working class blokes would have a good night there, you know? 
So that's the only, that's the only, people, people keep saying to me, what, you know, all these Harvard graduates, you know, what's your, what's your policy on bollocks? It's nothing <laughs> as, it's nowhere near as complicated as that. Basically, if Azza likes it, it'll work. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, if you, if you said that, you'd destroy all these courses, all these seminars of teaching people things. It's all complete nonsense. It's common sense. It's just targeting your market and saying, how do we give this person, man or woman, a good night out, a price they can afford, and create a memory that they will tell their friends or the people that work about? This is how darts has worked. It's purely a matter of word of mouth. People go and say, what a night I had. And someone else goes, what's that? And he says, the darts. And bosh, before you know it, before you know it, it took 10 years. But before, that's a relatively short time in the world of sport. Before you know it, you've created something just monstrous. All on the basic principle of giving people value for money. Uh, darts, I was just about to say that to you, because darts, a darts night out is immense. You can't have a better night out. What a laugh. No, you can't. And, you know, it's just so lovely to see... You know, but they, they they try to people try to headhunt me to head up things. They don't really understand me. I don't do chairmen. I do owners. You know, <laughs> because the worst thing about doing chairmen is that someone else either reaps the rewards or disagrees with you. And when you are a benevolent despot like myself, people disagree with you. I'm not to be tolerated for too long. Yeah, you don't do committees. No, I don't do committees. You know, we had that with Swill, same thing we had with Scottish football, you say that. But you don't do committees. You know, it does rely on everyone pulling together, but you need to be united in anything. You know, in a match room, you know, I've handed down the, the poison chalice now to Eddie. He will do the same thing. We will listen, but when we make a decision, we don't. Yeah. And we go 101%. We don't go 95%. You know, it's a real shit. But if once we believe in something, you know, and we're a tough operation past because we've got this momentum of self-belief, which is, it's really nice. Even, I mean, we make loads, seriously, we make loads of mistakes. But we make thousands of decisions. You're not going to get it right all the time. Yeah, yeah. You know, but you mustn't ever go into a situation thinking you might not. You have to be believing in yourself. You have to be positive. So when we went into boxing, it was all simple. Going to change the sport. Going to change boxing. I think we played a, I think we played a role in it. I think Eddie's taken it to another dimension. In, in our youth fighters, my youth, my heroes used to retire with no money. Used to retire having been ripped off by people or not getting paid by people. Today's world... The top boxers have got the best accountants, the best lawyers that create multi-million pound fortunes for themselves and their family. And that filters down to the not so, you know, not, not big champions. There's a level now where it's a better sport to be involved. And it's a dangerous sport, they so they deserve to be paid well. But you need a flag bearer. So the Anthony Yoshua's of this world, it's from the areas that we all came from and look at Anthony Joshua and say, I want to be like him. The knowledge that if I work hard and I show commitment and I have ability, it is possible. It's difficult, but it's possible. And that's the same as the Olympics or anything else. It, you know, it gets kids motivated, gets them off their backside, gets them out there saying, don't feel sorry for yourself, go and change your life. I did it in my business. Joshua's done it with his gloves on, you know. Doesn't mean where, it doesn't matter who you are. It's, it's a mindset thing to give it a real good go and 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 they won't not everyone not everyone succeeds yeah. that's life did you have any idea when you were bringing eddie into the box inside of it you know you had some huge nights yourself obviously but as you've said eddie's taking it to another level did you have any clue that he was going to be able to do that or i mean yeah, i knew he, he was in two we, the Hearns are always enthusiastic in everything, but sometimes we're not we're not good, but we bullshit our way out of it somehow. <laughs> so 
I mean, Eddie went off and, and did his own thing, which, which I wanted him to do, you know. I said, when you're good enough, when you're good enough to be a part of this company, I'll know and you'll know. And he went off and he did double blazing salesman. You know, all the things that really they, they teach you, you know, cold call, cold canvas calling. Oh, man, that's brutal. But that teaches you, you know. People say no to you in life, don't they? Yep. So you've got to learn to ignore it. You've got to get back. People are nasty to you, so you've got to develop hard skin, you know, so it doesn't get to you. You've got to think on, you've got to think on your feet at speed, speed, speed. Well, he went off and did all that, and he joined a sponsorship company, and he started doing deals. He's a hustler, same as his old man. I mean, when I die, it don't really matter. Because basically, it's just me and another body. <laughs> he sounds so much like me. He steals most of my quotes. I just read his book, Relentless, plug, plug. It's a really good book. But honestly, most of the lines in it are mine. Trust me, they're not his. Don't, don't listen to him. So, and then he... He was ready, and uh, he came back, and uh, he was very keen. He's a sportsman, you know. He's a good. He was a good cricketer, golfer, decent boxer, uh, and I put him in charge of the uh, golf division, and he made a success of that. And then I had a massive uh, poker business at that time. We was promoting all the poker shows around the world. I put him in charge of that because he was very good at credit control, because he's a lump, and. Uh, he did a really good job on that. And then he came to see me and said, it's time, I want to do the boxing. And, you know, boxing is a really horrible, tough business outside the ropes as well as inside the ropes. And I'd probably just about had enough, you know. Uh, and he was so keen. Hey, listen, that's what dads are for. Well, if you can help your son, you know, silver spoon kid. Yeah, but I just, I'd give him a lift up. You know, he could have fallen flat on his face. That was up to him. And he... He had an advantage, but you can only do you can only play the cards you're dealt in life, and he played them really well. And what he's done on boxing, I've given up criticising. He used to come and see me and say, "I want to do such and such." And I went, "Are you off your trolley?" <laughs> you know, I want to do frotch grows at Wembley. What are you mad? Do you know how expensive it is to do a show in Wembley? Sells eighty thousand tickets. Shut the fuck up, Baz. <laughs> and then, so then last year he said to me you know during covid he's like i mean again when we talk about covid we're a, we're a little miracle company our people are so inventive i mean we were doing darts tournaments on your iphone around the world selling them to tv we did more events during the, a year of covid than we do in a normal year yeah. but they were behind closed doors they didn't make as much money but they kept everybody working. Yeah. Everybody had a wage because my people are self-employed sportsmen. You know, so if they don't get an event, they don't earn. Simple as that. So we felt obligated if we had to finance it, we financed it because we're big enough and ugly enough to do that. We believe in saving, having rainy day funds. Well, it hasn't been raining. It's been pissing down. Hasn't it? I mean, it's, but we've coped with it. And we've seen, and one of the ideas was Eddie coming and said, I want to do fight camp. I want to do this in the garden. I'm like, what? My garden? That lawn, that, that lawn's been done. I said, have you any idea what this is going to cost? He went, yeah, he showed me the figures. It's over, a, the setup was over a million quid. I went, are you mad? Oh, it was massive success. Made a load of money again. So I don't even say anything now. He comes <laughs> in. Whatever he, as he walks in the door, I go, yeah, do it. Spend the money. Do what you like. No, there's no point in arguing because he's always right. But he's got a vision, and a vision is built around social media and casual fans and interacting with people. I think, you know, we've been very blessed to be in, the, in sport at a time when there's been some big changes. For me, the blessing was colour television, for example. Subsequently, the blessing became sky television. Finance, you know, finance, money, subscriptions. Now, Eddie's blessing is that we're at the time of sports streaming. This podcast is, a, is an example of how the digital world has changed. And, and, and it's giving people enjoyment and value. Uh, sports streaming services are not unique. There are several of them. And DAZN, uh, I think the one which I, I back, I think they're going to have a, a lot of success globally. So we'll wait and see. But... If they become the Netflix of sport, then they will be built into a massive company, largely on matchrooms, programs, and production. 
So it's a good responsibility on us and we're, we're getting well paid for it. And uh, more importantly, given the freedom to put on shows that we think work and to put in production and teams, presentation teams, that we think the public would like. And it's really nice to be, you know, it's a bit Clement Attlee, if you like. It's cradle to grave philosophy. I want to see my company involved from the inception of an idea right through every gambit, from the staging, the production, the presentation, the sponsoring, the syndication, the gambling, whatever it is. You know, you want to own every single part. That That's part of our ethos is control, you know. Because once we do that, like the old trade union leaders, we're into the world of collective bargaining. In other words, we control. You know, why has dance become so big? 128 dance players 10 years ago, 15 years ago, were generating 500,000 pounds of prize money a year. Why? Because they all went off in their own little tangents, did their own little deals. You know, thought small, had no vision. So I've got a better idea. If you've got a product that's good and the demand is there, all get together. There's only one shop to go to. You either, if you don't like us, see you later. I'm not bothered. Go. If you do, you pay the right price. Yeah. And we have a responsibility to every one of those 128 players. They're now playing for 15 million pounds and darts is changing people's lives. Who'd have thought that possible? Who'd have thought that possible? You go back to the old days, the Anglo-Saxon times, when they went to the ale house. And the archers took their arrows out of their quill <laughs> and they broke them in half. And they threw the small part at targets in a pub. And that was called arrow. <laughs> and that's where it all began. <laughs> Who'd have thought there wasn't one shout of 180 in all those days? But now we have a sport where we're on the threshold. Stupid though this may sound to certain people. This on the threshold of becoming a major global sporting act. No barriers to entry, no hefty club fees, no expensive equipment, simplistic game to play, really difficult game to master, and financial rewards that can change your life. This will be the sport of the next 10 years, and it will grow and grow and grow. Good time to be at the club. And the next, the next world champion is going to be friend of the show from our uh, broth. Alan Souter, he's qualified for the Ali Pali this year. We're coming down with him. He's, uh, he's done, uh, listen, I'm an anorak, right? I'm also a man of great detail. Because I'm a chartered accountant, don't be put off by the Barrett Boy bullshit. <laughs> I'm super smart. It also means I log everything, I read everything, and I know most, not everything. Alan Souter, I've been watching him for his career. To be fair, he's gone off the boil a little bit in his last few events. But he had a fantastic start to his professional career. Money to a card, made a name for himself. Now, that sometimes happens because of the adrenaline and the happiness yeah. that you're now in the big world. And there's no pressure on you because you're not defending anything, are you? Yeah. you know? uh, and suddenly, his only problem he's got at the moment, and I don't even know the kid, I and mean, he's not a kid, but I don't know him, is he may just 5% of his brain might be believing he's the real deal because he started too well. Yeah. Most people don't win what he's won already prior, in a year, he, what he won in the first three months. Yeah. And he's, he's slowed down a little bit. He's just got to go back and remember where he came from. Remember he's up for none. No pressure. Just throw darts. And who knows, you know, he's got the opportunity. You know, the, the tournaments are there. I think he's in the... He'll qualify probably for the Players' Championships this year. You, you know, he, he may qualify for Ali Pali. He's not... Yeah, he has. He already has. He's Has got he got into Ali Pali already? Yeah. 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 We're going down. Smoke, Smokey's in wine on yeah, tour. We're, we're coming down for it. Yeah, but I'm just trying to think. How is he qualified for Alexandra Palace already? Because we just said so. 
It's to oh. do with the it's, <laughs> it's to do with the amount of money you win in the first twelve months or something like that. And, yeah. and he's no, but he's got to be in the top thirty-two. He's got to be in the top thirty-two if he's qualified. He's not in the top thirty-two of the Order of Merit, so he hasn't qualified that route. The second route is to be in the top thirty-two uh, on the one-year list. Yeah. That's the list you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is he in the top thirty two of the one year list? You're just a way to check this now, aren't you? Look. You're bloody right, I am, because I don't I didn't think he was. Uh, now he'll listen to this, so right, for our listeners, know. Barry well, Hearn has now got his laptop out. Put his no, got, no, I'm not, I don't <laughs> he's got the group sheets. I don't do laptops, mate. I, what I do is Oh no, he's got the pads paper. out. Bits of paper and Looking at this earlier today, so it's so frustrating. Where is it? So suits. Listen, if, if you're listening, yeah. suits. Barry's just winked at me and said you're in anyway. Suits, <laughs> suits. I don't want to do you any harm. I really hope you make it. And I'm going to look and find out that later on because I don't want because it's already half past nine and I'm going to be getting yeah, bored. Of course, of course. The point is, suits is a good example of what darts can do and yeah. why we're in darts. Exactly. He's, I don't, as I say, I don't know, but I'm guessing his age, he's like mid 40s. Yeah, 43. So he's been around the amateur game, done okay, not done special. Suddenly got his chance in the big league. Suddenly he's a dance professional. The plan is always when I, when I brought in Q School, I wanted to make that feel the pride when you get your turn. You know, it's like your Willy Wonka goal. And someone like Suits has come along later on in life. He's not a kid. Yeah. Suddenly, he's so excited for him. Yeah. And that excitement, which is just got to be careful, that excitement doesn't turn to pressure. You know? The excitement of, fuck it, I'm 40 odd years old. I'm not an 18 year old kid who's got, just been doing this his whole life. He come out, he's come out of the old school of darts. The new school of darts is all about money. Just eight hours a day, bang, 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 bang. Now, so he's got his chances. This is like, this is like me getting picked for England over seven. Like, <laughs> wow, <laughs> oh, you're so excited. It's such a buzz. And he's going there and he's looking around the room and he's going, well, I've met most of these folks at either exhibitions or something, but I'm actually beating against them now. My level playing field. You feel good about yourself. You feel like you're absolutely, I'm a proper player. And then you beat one of them and you can't quite believe it. You have to have a word with yourself in the toilet. Water on your face. Don't get carried away. You can't control the adrenaline. Your hand is shaking. Then suddenly you realise, I'm on a monkey. I won my first game on a pro tour. I win one more game, I'm on a grand. This is decent money. This is that, and so I've got four of these in a row, and then suddenly wins a few quid, you know, and you go home and your family. Go, what do you mean? What do you mean you got four grand? You don't normally win more than fifty quid, seventy-five <laughs> quid, hundred quid, yeah. So all of that has got to be captured and then controlled. Controlling it is different mental side of it. But you know, to have the opportunity, to have that chance to do something in your life, really. Yeah. I can't underestimate that because one day the good Lord will just call us and we'll have to go. Before we go, we want to know that we gave self every opportunity. Absolutely. In his own words, Suits is doing that. And, you know, I'm not saying he's going to make it or not make it, but he's got the chance to make it. And that's my job. I can't make people win or lose. I talk to them, I can hopefully inspire them with the knowledge I have. But really, my job is to give them the opportunity. And then I sit back and have the pleasure of watching them either succeed or fail. It's, but sport has to be brutal to be entertaining. It's not just a boys club where we give out money for it. You've got to earn it. Yeah. And there will be times you look in the mirror and wish you'd never picked up. Or you'd never picked up a dart. Or you'd never picked up a cue. When things go bad, we find out, what have you got? What are you really made of? In business, it works the same way. It's about, it's called character. What have you got? Because anyone make money in my business when the going's good. What are they like when the going's shit? 
<laughs> can you cope with that? Because I can. And if you can't compete with me in my business, then you're not going to beat me, are you? And the same rule applies in sport. When the doubles aren't going in, you must believe that you have the ability to turn that around on one day, they will. And if you do, I believe enough, they will. But <clears throat> what a lovely night. What a lovely night. When we go down Ali Pali to watch suits in our in our white suits, you can drag out your old white suits from the seventies. <laughs> I, I watched a program yesterday on John Travolta. Yeah, the first thing I thought about was I used to wear a suit like that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It was a, it was just a way of uh, it's my old accounting days because I had so many chips on my shoulder when I was younger about rich kids. And, um, and I knew I was good. I was always worried about not being noticed. I decided to get noticed. They may not have liked it, but I got noticed. <laughs> but when you get, when you wear a white suit in an accounting profession, you better be good, son. You better. <laughs> Who was your biggest rival uh, in terms of, in, in any of the sports, uh, you know, uh, uh, in the opposite corner or anything like that? Would it be Frank Warren in the boxing or yeah, was there someone else? Ian Doyle. Oh, yeah, I think Ian Doyle became a big rival. Well, a big rival and became bigger. Henry became the best player in the world. And, you know, frankly, when you there's different attitude here between managing sportsmen and women and promoting sports events. I don't particularly like managing people. It, I, I don't like the responsibility. It's like having extra children, you know. Uh, with, with sports events, if things go wrong, I can turn them off. If I turn off a human being, I usually get about 18 years, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, people... When I, when I look at competition, I've had mean, lots of competition in different sports. I don't actually view them as competition because I have this enormous um, opinion of myself. You know, when you talk about self-belief, it can get out of hand. Often with me, you know, people are often tell me, I just believe I'm, I'm unbeatable. I think I'm unbeatable anything I turn my mind to. I'll lose the old battle, but I'll never lose the war because people don't have my work ethic or my commitment or what I'm prepared to pay any type of price to it. That sounds easy to say, but truth is over my 45 years my record stands up. So Frank Warren occasionally has been, you know, a big competitor in boxing. Suddenly well, suddenly not a competitor to Eddie at all. And what but then no one is. You know, I was operating at a certain level, Warren was a similar level. We were competitors. Same as me and Ian Doyle, you know, things like that. My biggest competition would be between TV, rival TV stations. Obviously, yeah. if I'm with Sky, you know, if I'm with BBC, you know, you get that into it. Um, yeah, and again, the bigger you get, the less competition you have because it's a real tough fight. I mean, it was a tough fight to go against me just with my own enthusiasm, but now because of the size we are, and the clout and the financial strength we have, it's a hell of a... F I mean, I wouldn't want to take me on. I wouldn't want to... <laughs> Certainly wouldn't take Eddie on. Jesus Christ. I, I, I said to him the other day in some of these boxing promoters, I genuinely, from my heart, I really feel sorry for him. Because, number one, they know that every fighter they've got would rather be with Eddie. <laughs> that, that must be horrible. <laughs> because we all, we all fall in love with our fighters, you know. You know I, I've done it all my life, you know. And when they leave or they become disloyal, you, you feel robbed. But you, you've got to understand, it's a very short-term career. So how do you feel when people that you're promoting really, really want to be somewhere else? And secondly is you must know that you can't win. You know, in this, in this new age of social media, Eddie with two million social media followers can't be beat because he has access to that level of people that me with my 100,000 can't compete with. And that's not, you know, Eddie's smart and he's very presentable and he's a, he's a lovely, lovely person. What would you expect to say? He's my son, you know, but I don't do him any favours, as you could probably guess by our conversation. He's just bloody good. And if he was yeah. shit, trust me, I would tell him he's shit. But, you know, <laughs> but for everyone else, he doesn't look at it like that. You know, he's... Bob Aram a competitor? Yeah, in a way. 
is Al Heyman a competitor in the States? Yeah, in a way. Warren? Yeah, in a way. But in all honesty, it's a bit like saying that Sainsbury's have got a competitor in the shop on the corner. <laughs> they are a competitor, really, aren't they? Local. Yeah. They're a local competitor, but they're not a global competitor. And that's another world. Was there ever anyone, again, doesn't matter the sport here, but anyone that you wanted to sign, but for whatever reason didn't get them? Is there anyone that, you know, the one that got yeah. away? Or did you get everyone that no, you wanted? No, 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 no. No, Stairs has got away. I mean, I'm, I'm a fan of sport. I'm a fan of sportsmen and women. Uh, you know, you look at it and you think, I look on it rather than sportsmen. I look on events the whole way rather than individuals. Right. So not doing Ben Eubank three still haunts me to this day because really? that was that was made. You know, I made that. You know, Ben Eubank one was amazing. One of the best fights I've ever seen. Nineteen nineteen. Ben Eubank two. Yeah, it wasn't such a good fight, but it was probably a big fight. Uh, and, and we were all set, but of course, you know, fires go their, their own ways and politics comes into it. Fight never got made. I mean, I had a fighter once, Jose Luis Lopez, which you've never heard of, nor should you. But I think he was the greatest fighter I ever had. And he was a Mexican. Diet. He was the mandatory challenger to Eamon Loughran for the WBO welterweight title. And I did the fight. And Lopez stopped Loughran in 57 seconds of the first round. And I ended up with three options on him, which I, I didn't know what to do. He's a Mexican. He had three losses on his record. I didn't realise at the time he was 14 when he had those three losses. And I should have looked into it a bit closer. Um, there was no box wreck back then. No, 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 there was. It was just, <laughs> just complacency. I thought, Eamon Loughran, you know. Sorry, Eamon. I, I completely cocked up. I've told him that before. He's forgiven me now. But uh, this kid was an unbelievable fight. People in the gym, Eubank, Ben, people like that, would stop and watch him train, watch him spar. Never seen anything like it. I'll tell you how good he was. Oscar De La Hoya, his prime, categorically refused to fight this kid. All oh, right. You can't put a brain where there's no brain. And... <laughs> Gave him, we, we had a fight uh, for the world title where he worked out his own tactics. And his tactics were, it was Felix Trinidad, I think, or was it Ike Corti? One of those, he was one of the top fighters in the world. Jose's tactics were don't throw a punch for six rounds, fire him out, because he could take a punch. And he got battered for six rounds. I went in the corner at the end of the sixth round and said, what are you doing? He said, I have a plan. I said, your plan is getting you killed. And he went out and he battered this other kid six rounds, dropped him in the 11th and got a draw. Could have stopped, didn't, got a draw. And he got paid, a hundred. I gave him $100,000 as a challenger for that fight. And I never saw him again. He took the money, he'd never seen $100,000 before. He took the money and he disappeared. Went off on a, I don't know, surfing somewhere. And I saw his name seven or eight years later, boxing as a cruiserweight. He was a welterweight, obviously. Boxing as a cruiserweight in some six round. But technically and physically, he was the greatest fighter I've ever seen. Wow. So it's things like that you remember which disappoint you. But of course, you know, the pluses are far outweigh the negatives, you know. With me, Davis, Eubank, now Anthony Joshua has added another dimension to my life of watching great sportsmen achieve their dreams and create moments that will live with me in my memory. You know, if you, if you start thinking about things that you would like to remember just before you pass, or to be so negative, but before you pass, you know, you should sit down quietly and write down 10 things yourself. I have. And the 10 things, I think three of them were late and Orient based. Football, still a passion, not about money, about passion. AJ, Klitschko, Eubank, Ben, Davis, 1981, 
things like that, you know, when you add them all together, all it does, it makes you smile, doesn't it? Yeah. You know what? We, ne we never think about the money. Write down 10 things that you'd like to be, you'd like to be either remembered for or in your life. And my wife will always criticise me and say, well, where's the, where's the birth of your children on that? Yeah. So you have to say, outside of my family, these are my 10 favourite yeah. things, or you get killed. <laughs> My top ten are all Stephen Hendry's, I'm afraid. So. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, great player. I mean, he's a great, great player. And, uh, he was playing in that momentous match with Mark Williams, you know, and he's still licking his wounds at being outmaneuvered. So. <laughs> but he outmaneuvered me, you know. I mean, I remember him coming on, and, and I've got this kid, which you know, and I'd, I'd already heard of him. We'd already seen him coming. Obviously, I knew. Uh, that he was going to be a good player. I didn't know how good. And he said, uh, can we have Davis for a week? I'm up here and to Scotland. Yeah. And Davis, he didn't really want to go. And I said, listen, this kid's going to be a great player. He says, I want you to go. I want you to smash this little bastard. Seven days a week. I said, I want him, <laughs> I want him done. Seven times big margin. I want his brain in a jam jar on my mantelpiece. <laughs> Every time he thinks about you, I want him to have nightmares. It's the one way we'll stop him becoming fake. Davis went up, done him like a kipper. Seven days, nine nil, nine one, nine two. I mean, it was merciless. The worst bloody thing we ever did. <laughs> because uh, he, 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 that, he yeah. learned from it and he came out as a stronger player. Yeah. Uh, you know, it was inevitable. He, Stephen Hendry was great player whether he's the best of all time he's in, he's in a group of two or three or four maximum and he's probably arguably the best of all of them nice, well, we, nice kid as well and a decent golfer we had we had Mikel Atab on last week and we said uh, about snooker players and we said we'd uh, put our life on Henry but we'd pay to watch Ronnie yeah, that's, a good, that's a good one it was a bit like Alex as well. The same thing would be you put in the in the previous generation. Yeah, you'd have put your life on Davis and paid to watch Higgins. You know, Steve yeah, exactly. used to say to me when he walked into an arena, "Why do I get booed when I walk in?" And I went, "Because you win everything." Yeah, and that you know that was Hendry as well. Uh, Ronnie is, I think, probably the greatest of all time, but simply because he can do both. You know, he can scrap it out. His safety is good. His attacking is good. He's right-handed. He's left-handed. He's got the complete game. But he's also still got, no, no matter the bullshit he talks, still got that love. He's got that passion. He doesn't play all the time, but that's okay. But he's still got that passion to play. That comes, that's from deep. You know, that's not too difficult. Yeah. I think Ronnie O'Sullivan is the greatest player in the I, I think in most sports, um, the, the sign of the best player in any sport is when the competitors shit themselves playing that person. You know, Steve Davis was always a many frames up before he started. Same as Ronnie, same oh, as Henry. I can remember a lot of Steve's opponents. I would, I would get to the hotel on the, day of, on the day of the match and I would see his opponent checking out. Yeah. And I hadn't started playing. And I, I'd go in the dressing room and say, you won't believe what I've just seen Steve. <laughs> they would be like, whoa, let's go and rip you. And it was that. That was it. Yeah, it was good. This is one that I, I don't know if you'll be able to answer or not, and it'll all be on Eddie, to be perfectly honest, but do you think he'll get the AJ Tyson Fury fight over the line eventually? Well, I thought, it, to be honest with you, I thought it was absolutely done. I mean, I, sometimes I'm getting old and cynical, I know. I don't really believe a lot of things people say. I believe what I say, and that's about as far as I can go. So the fact that it didn't happen last time really concerns me personally that it'll ever happen. Because I don't know yeah. what else you've got to do. I mean, you had a massive, massive offer, 75 million or They made Tyson Fury and his camp, and I, you know, I'm not privy to their meetings, but between them, they, they jumped at that Deontay Wilder fight for a fraction of that money so quickly and made no effort whatsoever 
whatsoever to buy off Deontay Wilder. You see, I don't know that, you know, if we speculate on rough numbers. So on the one hand, he's got guaranteed 75 million. Guaranteed from the, from the team. So what's he getting to fight Deontay? 20? 15? 20, let's say 25. 25 million instead of 75. Both tough fights because although he's beaten Deontay Wilder, Deontay Wilder can still punch. He's not very good as a fighter, technically, but he can punch, yeah. so he's always going to be dangerous. AJ can punch. And, you know, people have different opinions on how that fight's going to go. I'm biased. I think AJ knocks Bob out. But I can understand Tyson Fury fans saying, you're too smart, too clever, blah, blah. Okay, but we're just talking money. So why didn't they find, you know, why didn't they say to Deontay, how much do you want? What's Deontay getting? 10 million? So would 20 million suit you just to wait six months? Because it's only a phone call to the Saudis or to us, because we've lost as well. I mean, Alexander Utsik is a big fight for Joshua and a dangerous fight. But, but it doesn't make 75 mil. It makes a lot, but not 75. So I'm not saying that we would have chipped in. It's just business, isn't it? If you're losing 50 million, would you contribute 10? It's not jump change, is Bloody it? Bloody right, you would. No, but, you know, it's business. It's, see, it's not egos, it's business. So I draw from that, rightly or wrongly, and as usual, rightly, that I, Tyson Fury don't want the fight. That, because there's no common sense beyond that. Uh, and that means, do we ever get to see him? Yeah. So the first obstacles, obviously, are Alexander Utik for Joshua on September 25th, for which, by the way, interestingly enough, we could have sold 200,000 tickets on the first day it went on sale. We sold 70,000. We had 100 and something thousand people waiting. Phenomenal. Wilder could get lucky against Fury and knock him out because he has the power. Both AJ and Fury are favourites, but favourites get beat in two horse races. Yeah. Uh, if they do both come through, Eddie believes, Eddie doesn't share my convictions, I will say that, but then he's not a cynical old man, he's an enthusiastic young man. <laughs> uh, he believes that the fight can take place in February. Right, okay. Till you see those two physically getting through the rope, <laughs> I believe anything you read in the paper. We'll just get in touch with you, mate, and we'll find out in the next podcast. This is already you've gone over an hour. You're very unlikely to get another podcast while you are living, you know. This way. <laughs> <laughs> well, ask you one, one last question, then we'll let you go. No, there. You've, got, you've got five more minutes. Make the most of it. You can do, do three questions because I talk too long anyway. <laughs> I was going to say, well, we'll not even get what, one question in the five minutes. <laughs> Obviously, you've stepped down. Yeah. Uh, you know, Eddie, Eddie's taken over. You're the, sort of the president now. Yeah. From your point of view, what would you like to see next for Matchroom? It's mm, a good question. Um, well, I think I'm really enjoying the last two weekends I've had going to fight camp. Not just because I've enjoyed having shows in my car. <laughs> I have to say the burgers are unbelievable. And it's a good commute. Oh, mate. mate proper. But it's a proper night out. I'm, I'm enjoying... My job now is sort of strategy more than anything else. So my next plan in 2022 is I'm going to spend a lot more time and energy on spreading the globalisation of, of dark. Also a sport that I think has got huge potential, which is nine, American ball, like Moscone, nine ball ball. It's got the history, it's got some great players, and it's a global game. So I'm going to spend time on that. Um, Matchroom itself, I'm just thoroughly entertained by the fact that there's so many young people grasping an opportunity, sportsmen and women, to one side, but employees of Matchroom, they get the freedom there, and it's the freedom I would have, you know, I'd have absolutely loved when I was younger. Now you can see those that are going to get there, and those who might not, you know. 
Some people leave at five o'clock. Other people don't leave. No, it's a, it's a commitment thing, and I, I enjoy watching that. I think the company's is bound to get bigger and bigger. Lots of people want to buy us, but how do you buy someone's life? You know, you sell companies. You this is more than that, and I think it's more than that to Eddie as well. But it is a changing world we live in. You know, you've only got to look at Disney, Amazon, The Zone, Comcast, yeah. Netflix, your podcast. I mean, these are major, you know, these are all major moves in the industry. <laughs> so, I don't know. I don't know what, I don't really know what I want. I'd just like it to go on for a bit longer and, you know, I'm, I'm enjoying watching it. But in the meantime, you know, I've got fish to catch. I've got runs to get. If I'm going to get in that England over 70s, I'm going to have to have a big season next year. It's interesting when you look to think, you keep up enthusiasm, ability levels off, you know. Yeah. Whereas I might not have been good enough playing with the current 40 years ago, I might be good enough to play with them now because I haven't deteriorated body-wise quite as much as the normal person. Because of course, I've been I've been rebuilt a few times. It just you know, what I like to see match room is I'd like to just see it. I like to see the alpacas growing. I like to see the peacocks still straining. You know, I want to be a different type of company. I don't want to be the norm. I want to be I want to be a little bit fringe, but at the same time creative and innovative within sport. And I want to be able to look at people. As I can now, some of my past sportsmen and women, I feel, I feel proud about where they've taken their life. Because it's, you know, that, that I think is the best. You know, because sport doesn't last forever. Yeah. And taking your matchroom hat off, what's your actual favourite sport to watch then? It's, it's different <laughs> because I love all of them. I don't, I only promote sports I, I'm passionate about, but... You'd have to say boxing, really, for the drama of one night, one punch, one, you know, one fight. Changes lives, you know, sometimes, sadly, affects lives badly. The drama of boxing is something quite unique. Perhaps the sort of what I would compare to a good Agatha Christie novel, Crucible, and the build-up of the drama over a period of time for the snooker is something very special. Because that... You know, it's almost, you're just getting it to bubble on. You know, it, it just creates something. All sports should create memories. I mean, it's it's interesting, you know, my, my wife breeds racehorses. For 35 years, she's worked incessantly on these horses. And this year, she's, she's had an amazing year, this year. Yeah. And with the Gold Cup, Ascot Gold Cup. Yes. Yeah, Fire Gold difference. Cup and the French and Ledger. And then the horse is injured at the moment, and we don't know if he's going to run again. So you know, the peaks and troughs of sport. Yeah. You know, in one day I got gold cup. That would be one of my top ten memories because the horse was just magnificent. And that look, it's like her, one of her children in a way, you know. And then to hear within a few days that he had an injury, and it goes from being the best four-year-old in the world to maybe it never runs again. And that's something you have to appreciate the moment in sport, you know, and in life. You have to appreciate moments because if you let them pass you by, you've lost that moment of real excitement and real appreciation. Well, we're down at the Crucible next year and VIP tickets, mate. So we'll invite you to our table <laughs> for some glorious moments. Well, I, I really, it's going to be very difficult for me to refuse. However, I have a feeling I might be somewhere else that day. <laughs> <laughs> I, and of course, but the way you say you might invite you to our table, means you've never been to the Crucible because there are no tables at the Crucible. There are tables at the Darts at Alexandra Palace, which is what you're obviously <laughs> getting your Scottish brain confused with. But let's hope the Suits <laughs> does indeed make it to Alexandra Palace. And I will see you there for what will be a memorable night. And thanks for your time. These podcasts are interesting and they're fascinating to get points across to people, in, as we've done tonight, I hope, in a different sort of way. I'm sure people will love it. Barry, thanks so much for your time. Pleasure, it's been a pleasure talking to you. We'll hopefully catch up again at something. Look after yourself. Stay healthy. Take care now. Bye. Bye-bye. You've been listening to the Smokies and Wine podcast. 
Sponsored by Clackenview Wealth Management. Working with you today to plan for your tomorrow.